Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Say no to rape. Welcome to The Advocate and to a melting pot of thoughts, analysis, and solution. I'll be highlighting the caricature that is the Niger Delta development of what I call commie chop. For those who like dining with a long spoon, Rukewe courageously takes on our decaying healthcare system and reminds us that good healthcare should not be for the privileged few, but for all. Treasure is also talking on a topic that is not for the faint-hearted the recent tragic rape and brutal killing of young girls in their prime. Seydou is unflinching as he attacks a story that has ignited the global grapevine, the killing of George Floyd, and then Akiwumi Adishino and the African Development Bank. Omega is not one to shy away from controversy, so he's in good company this week. He's asking whether science is the new God. I wait to hear him answer this one. Since he's fast becoming our new theology expert, Doubtless, you are beginning to feel the pulse on today's edition, bold and unapologetic in taking on those burning issues of the day. You will be well advised to make yourself comfortable. It promised to be an unrelenting hour after the break. Growing up as a child, I remember Hotel de Jordan, Poma de Sofa, Moki de Walk, Bambo de Chop. And that's what the Niger Data Development Commission, what I call him Commit Chop, has turned to. One cannot help but notice the accusation, counter-accusation, and show of shame currently going on in the Niger Data Development Commission, a commission supposedly set up for the development of the oil-rich Niger Delta, but which from inception had been turned to a comp-chop venture by government officials and its management, the recent being the allegation of misappropriation and bare-faced fraud between the Interim Management Committee, IMC, of the commission, the former board of the commission, National Assembly, and concerned stakeholders. Fortunately or unfortunately, the head of the former board in Simai Kere, who was the APC governorship candidate in the 2019 governorship election in Akwaibon State, was a deputy governor to the current minister of Niger Delta, Goswin Akwabio, in his first term as Akwaibon State governor. He's the same minister that set up the interim management committee. The question then is, can the minister altruistically set up a committee to probe his former deputy on looking into the affairs of his party members? Your guess is your guess, so leave my guess out of it. As it was even alleged in some quarters that some of the funds purportedly being investigated by the IMC were used to prosecute the 2019 election. I don't know which state were. However, one thing is clear and certain in all of it, NDDC is a clear house and cesspool of corruption. Don't ask me how, just follow me. The Interim Management Committee upon inauguration revealed that while carrying on an interim audit of the activities of the former board of the commission, discovered that 3.7 billion naira was paid for the supply of plastic, plastic chairs and that the address of delivery of the same chairs were the same warehouse of purchase. Round three purchase, you could say. The same IMC also alleged that the NDDC 2019 budget was padded with almost 15 new projects by members of the National Assembly. Paddy paddy arrangements. But while the dust was yet to settle on these allegations, some documents surfaced from some whistleblower NGO which revealed that in 2020 budget for the commission passed before the inauguration of the IMC, 800 million naira was a mark as contingency fund for regional road repair. But in a request for vehement made to the National Assembly by the IMC, which request by the provisions of the act setting up the NDDC is illegal, the IMC claimed to have spent 25 billion naira instead as contingency fund in six months. They spent seven billion or so, as claimed by them, on funds for training Niger Delta youth on welding. Ha! 3.4 billion naira on entrepreneurial development, and then 13 billion on 
spend on the headquarters. With all of this spending, you still wonder why there's massive unemployment, kidnapping, and youth restiveness in the, in, in the region. Even if it's free money, you don't have to spend it recklessly. But now hear this. On the 10th of January 2020, a memo from the Office of the Assistant Director General of Health requested for payment for some health and education project files, which was said to have been sent to the acting MD and was illustrated as purchase for Matana kits, 1.1 billion, cholera vaccine, 800 and 680 million, Lassa fever protective kits, 903 million, and then Lassa fever kits, 1 billion. Outstanding size equipment, 292 million. Again, on the 6th of April 2020, during the lockdown, where everybody was at home, while the company also was on lockdown, the head of the procurement unit, for and on behalf of the acting MD, awarded the contract to the company known as Signora Concepts Services Limited for the purchase of emergency specialized medical personnel protective equipment, PPE, for head workers and community based sensitization campaign against the spread of COVID 19 and other communicable disease in the ninth state of Niger Delta for the sum of 5.5 billion. Same contract was awarded on the same day for the same item by the same persons to another company, OMSEV Global Limited, to the tune of 4.8 billion naira. With all of this, yet nobody got any palliative, as it was even alleged that the acting MD's aide, a militant, went away with 1.175 billion million naira meant for palliative. 10.3 billion to sensitize Suna, make Una the fear God. No wonder some people have even argued that this pandemic has been turned to COVID-419 by some government agencies. From the foregoing, it is visible to the blind and audible to the deaf that NDDC has become a big conduit for siphoning government funds and has been turned into a comp chop instead of a commission. And the earlier the government does something about it, the better. I would therefore advocate that if the president is indeed sincere in cleansing the urgent table, he does not need an interim management committee, but a board properly constituted. Given the fact that members of the committee are neither auditors nor accountants, and their tenure is open-ended, all the president needs is a reputable forensic auditor to transparently look into the books of the commission. Why giving the EFCC the requisite backing and matching order to immediately bring to book anyone found culpable, be him a senator, Minister, management, or casual staff, even contractors who collected monies for job not executed. That way, he would not only have shown strength of character to fight corruption, but would be sending a strong signal to others that is indeed aware and sincere in fighting corruption. Otherwise, the government should forget and stop this noise about fighting against corruption as its people are neck deep in it. And I admonish you, let's continue to advocate for a better society with our voice. Well, I do not have um, the, the ability to reel out numbers as you did. So I'm just going to read out what I have also gathered, you know, regarding the monumental corruption at the NDDC. Now, there is a 641 million naira for media and communication support for forensic audit. There is a 39.4 million naira for consultancy on rebuttal of media attack. There is another 51 million naira monthly for two months for hotel bills for the acting MD. It's not, I'm not done. Other members were also getting 40 million naira for hotel bills. And this is an arrangement that is not contained in the NDDC Act. What's going on? Nine states of the Niger Delta, one would think with all of these monies, it will be a par there will be paradises. No. Nah, nah. Uh, it's I'm, I'm amazing. Gonna, uh, you know, for me, I, I've, I've, been, in, I've been in government, um, so I understand some of those things. I, I understand how this play works, and especially, uh, especially the COVID one. Yes. So every, everybody COVID said, everybody creates um, proposals, Head, yes. and headings, uh, you know, so it's used as a conduit. I think for me, really, it goes back to this thing about weak institutions. Um, so when you have a weak institution, or when an institution has been deliberately weakened, um, you're going to find this corruption. Um, it, you know, I think the, the way that I see it is that if you're strengthening institutions, if you don't politicize even the work of the people who are supposed to fight corruption, you know, because so you have this situation where uh, certain people are seen as, um, how shall I say it, they are protected. You cannot investigate them. They are part of the system. Mm. Um, they took part, they helped 
this particular administration government get to power, therefore they're, they're shielded. Once you have this kind of thing, then people will always run under it. And um, you know, it's, it's very helpful to hear this whistleblower you know, put out this kind of information. But I think that we need, there de definitely needs to be you know, action on the part of the, of the EFCC about what needs to be done to, yeah. to, to get to the I, bottom of it. Let's, let's quickly get Seydu and Rukewe. I'd like to um, just add to what uh, Emeka just said. Um, I think there's clearly a lack of accountability, and uh, you can see this is obvious. Um, I would want to put the blame squarely on the side of the supervising uh, parastatal, because these agencies, you know, they have uh, parastatal that they report to, and in this case, it's the presidency. There is no accountability. You don't have the... Uh, uh, they don't track KPIs. You don't have monthly reports. So of course, when you have, when you don't have anybody checking you, these things are bound to happen. And don't forget, this is an agency that is awash with a lot of money. So uh, I'm not surprised. All of these figures we're reeling out are just normal things that will happen when you don't have clear accountability. Yeah, Rukawa. Yes, um, very interesting topic, um, Barberis. Um, very topical. You see, um. This would be so laughable if it wasn't so tragic. Indeed, those numbers that you reeled out are really mind-boggling. Because I'm from the Niger Delta, it really feels very hurtful. Now, you see, there's this vicious cycle that you talked about, recycling politicians from governor to minister to board chairman. Everyone wants to be in the NDDC or have a role to play in it. Why is this happening? Because it's a cash cow. And like you said, you know, they use it to, to launder money or for elections or whatever, what have you. But you have to talk about the people that they bring in. So you have a board that is inaugurated, dissolved. Then you have interim board that has no, like you said, no end to it. Yeah. And these people are not even specialists. And most of them, many of them are politicians who are actually really quite broke because they actually ran for previous elections and lost. And so you bring them in, and then obviously they start taking um, advantage of all these huge, um, uh, what's it called, allowances and whatnot. But you've not talked about the civil servants, what we call evil servants. So new people come in on board and say, oh, Oga, okay, this is now what they do, I'm saying, so sign here, sign here. So those are systematic problems that we have to challenge um, for the status quo to improve. Indeed, a body like NDDC or any good government person so cannot have lifelong civil servants there because they know how the system works, they know how to corrupt it, yeah. they know how to bleed it. Yeah. And so for me, I think that for this real change to occur, this body cannot stand as it is. I'm from Delta State, as you know. Yeah, it should, should be in terror, sure, terror the management. Of the money is not equal among the nine states. Now, you said there's a constitution about the NDDC that yeah, determines yeah, the certain amount to come from a certain area at a certain time and all that, and it needs to go around. But what if the chairman comes from a different um, place that is not even producing much oil? Is he going to represent us in Delta yeah, State uh, or any uh, other state that is producing? This okay. whole thing needs to be reformed. That's what I right. think. <laughs> well, <laughs> unfortunately, um, for lack of time, um, we have still have, have other topics to deal with. It's time to hear Rookie's advocacy all the way from Canada. Welcome back, Rookie. Distance is no obstruction, thanks to Zoom. Let's zoom in. No, libraries, it certainly isn't, since the spirit of the advocate unites us all. After the break, I'll be raising an issue that all of us have a common interest in. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.
Good quality healthcare for Nigerians should not only be for the rich as being the outcry of the masses. As an important element of national security, public health not only functions to provide adequate and timely medical care, but also tracks, monitors, and controls disease outbreaks. The Nigeria healthcare system has suffered several infectious disease outbreaks year after year, be it Ebola, be it Lassa fever. Our inadequate healthcare system has been further exposed by this current pandemic called COVID-19. Where in a country of over 200 million people, we had less than 200 functioning ventilators as of March 2020, whether public, whether private medical institutions. Our Vice President, Yemi Osibajo, recently spoke about healthcare reform bills, mandating free healthcare for all Nigerians, where in fact, our existing healthcare bills have never been properly implemented. Free sounds nice, right? Free, someone must pay for it. In 2010, there was a 1% consolidated revenue of our annual budget signed into law to be appropriated to healthcare, and this has never been fully implemented. In fact, our same VP promised in 2018 that the president of Muhammad Buhari, even though it was a good luck, Jonathan Bill, will implement for the first time the 1%, and it was not done. Healthcare is not cheap. Someone must pay. So let's put it in context. United Kingdom has 67 million people. The annual budget for healthcare, 140 billion US dollars. In Canada, where I'm speaking to you from, we have 37 million people. Our budget, 200 billion US dollars annually. United States, biggest spender, with a population of 330 million spends 3.6 trillion US dollars for their healthcare annually as of 2019. These are the statistics. Now in 2020, there's a pandemic going on and they plan to increase it to $8.6 trillion. Guess what? Nigeria, we have a miserly 20 billion US dollars for a population of over 200 million people. And in fact, this health budget has been further cut this year. And if you're lucky, you get the full release of that money when in fact we never see up to 50% of it, according to all the health institutions across the country. We know that access to good quality healthcare is usually a function of wealth and status, but these meet <laughs> certain roadblocks when international and local borders have been locked down. The irony of a status government official returning from Germany to Abuja, then flying to Lagos for treatment for COVID-19, which he imported to Nigeria from Germany, only to be flown back from Lagos to be buried in Abuja cannot be lost in us. It will be actually laughable if it wasn't so tragic. What were his options? Of course, he couldn't go back to Germany, but why not Abuja? Why Lagos? Is Abuja not the federal capital territory? What happened to our almighty national hospital? What about the state house hospital? Where in a year, I think a couple of years ago, our first lady said, not even Panadol she could find in that clinic where billions of Naira have been appropriated. So my advocacy today is about the need to tackle the problem of our decaying healthcare systems, to talk about the inadequate funding of our health budget, the implementation of that said budget to all aspects of our healthcare, be it medical surveillance, intelligence for pandemics, be it training of, of staff, be it down to the primary health centers, which you know are the bread and butter of caring for the nation via health schemes. You can talk about state or national health insurance schemes. You know, let, let, me, let me talk, because we, we discussed this a little bit last week. Um, and the thing is this, we are treating two things that come to mind. Yeah. We, we see this COVID thing, as she said, Rick, Rick said, has exposed the fragility or the non-existence of infrastructure that we have as non far as health, uh, as healthcare is concerned. Mm. You say fragility, it's as uh, if well, it's there. <laughs> there. Yeah, there. But, but, but the other thing too that is, is important, so we see COVID, I mean, there's a lot of spending, you know, um, private companies are donating billions of Naira to it. We see people like NNDC and other yes. government agencies. Yeah. I'm using this as a, as a, as a vehicle to, 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 to siphon money. But it seems as if all of our health care is around COVID. 
but we have bigger problems. And so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, you know, it, it's, it's not COVID. COVID, COVID is just one thing. Um, so there's, <laughs> no, there's no thinking. There's no thinking, there's no planning. And, and just yesterday we heard in the review of the budget that the government slashed 40 something percent off of the health, the health the budget. budget. <laughs> so it, 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 it's. You I will mean, say budget now was not I, enough. I don't even understand. And so there's no emphasis. There's clearly, they slash education, they slash, they slash health. health. And they put 27 billion to, to renovate, renovate, to renovate national the National Assembly. National Assembly building. So you can find that the focus, the, the, the entire focus of the government in Nigeria is not about the people. No. It's about, it's about protecting privileged politicians and people right. who are close to them. That's what, that's, what, that's what we fight for, that politicians and people in government fight for, even the civil servants fight for, to protect the interests of those who are close to them. And I think that is the very big thing. We see it now with healthcare. And, and other governments in other countries are using COVID or, um, or this thing to revamp their own system. Yes. Rather, we are yeah. using yeah. it to kill the existing one. You took it right out of my mouth. One would have thought that the federal, both the federal and the state mm. government will use the opportunity of the COVID-19 pandemic to begin to restructure, re-strategize, carry out reforms within the Even though they have admitted oh, that have, it is this admitted. bad, they didn't know it was this bad, you know, but most of us have said it. I'll give you some it's not about saying it, it's about taking steps. Here. What has Ogun State done? What has Lagos State done? Even thank Lagos State, they're trying. Or your state, all the states, Kogi. They're, they're sharing and, and me. What are you doing concretely, actively, <laughs> to change the status quo, to change the present structure they're and welfare of those in the healthcare sector? But you uh, see, we're back to where we, where we were before COVID. Yeah. Uh, Sedu, you have something to say? Yes, yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at this from another perspective. Okay. I, I agree that you know there's a serious deficit in our health uh, sector. It's not just today; it's been there for a long time. Uh, but this pandemic has uh, created a unique opportunity for us. Um, what the government has done is created an opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors. In Nigeria today, one of the most lucrative sector that you can invest is health, uh, agri, and possibly education. Because these areas you could get uh, huge cheap, returns. You, know, you can get a whole lot of... So they've created that platform. It's now left for uh, businessmen and entrepreneurs to take advantage and build values on them. Uh, government cannot build all the hospitals. Okay. We need people to come in and invest in the healthcare. This is a good opportunity. All the so-called <laughs> big men can't fly out now. They have say, to invest. Tell me about it. Money. Money. A lot of money has come into that sector. Say, they have to, do. you know, put why we're not seeing movement in that direction. But you see a whole lot of uh, the value chain is filled up now. You see people invest in different, different areas, and that's very good for us. I, so uh, not looking at from, you know, it's the same narrative we've been talking about. Problem, problem, problem. But there is also opportunity brewing underneath, and I think we should also think about that one. F fantastic, yeah. uh, Sedu, quickly, quickly, um, 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 Rukawe, Rukawe is your advocacy, and since it's your advocacy, yeah. please permit us to just um, take a bite of it. Um, Sedu, <laughs> yeah. I wonder where this opportunity, where you're seeing them, because I am not seeing them, and I must I'm say business, frankly, I yeah, I agree you. with you. I agree with you. You're a businessman. Without the basic infrastructure, no matter how much of opportunity you create, nobody will go, nobody's going to live a comfortable place where the infrastructures are valuable and come site, you know, business in your places where the infrastructures are epileptic. And that's one. We'll also look at security issues. As we speak now, we, now we're just uh, 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 being awoken to the reality of rape, not the talk of kidnapping and all of that. And yet, when we talk about enabling environment, government needs to provide incentive and enabling environment. Not just to say, oh, with COVID, government has provided uh, the platform. The World Health Organization, their statistics, last year's statistics says that in Nigeria, you have uh, uh, 10,000 uh, uh, 10, people to one bed space. Not that people don't Sad. want to invest, but Sad. people want... Uh, a, a, a environment where there would be there will be re not just return on investment but security of funds invested as we speak and and so that said 
on the health care, the uh, um, uh, uh, Secretary of the Government of the Federation came out to say with COVID, when he visited Gogwala that hospital, he didn't know he was this bad. The first lady of the country said, head care, that's Asorok Clinic, that there is no Panadol mm. in Asorok. This is government owned. Government, nobody's even telling you build another one. With COVID, mm. we have hurriedly built up, you know, uh, mm -hmm. makeshift yeah, hospitals. Yeah, donated as well. Because what are, are we doing? To those what are we doing? No what are we doing to ensure okay. that those places that are without Panadol have Panadol okay. and the okay. ad hoc ones that we have you know, are permanent. This, that's the question. Let me just say that healthcare is seriously underfunded in Nigeria. Recently, I was on this same Plus TV channel, and the VP had said he was going to give free healthcare through healthcare reforms. Meanwhile, the National Health Act that says 1% of dated revenue should go into healthcare at $10.567 trillion. We, we don't have time. Naira, if we, we have time, I can give, 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 give more statistics. Dollars. Bottom line is we're not funding healthcare. It's a vexatious. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree, it's, I agree. It's, it's, it's annoying ah, and frustrating. I agree, I agree. Well, I concur. Today's advocacy is certainly not for the faint-hearted. In that vein, some issues simply cannot be ignored, no matter how distressing. I'm in confrontational mode after the break. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. The cry for justice should be innate in all human beings. Justice for Uwa, justice for Tina. Both stories broke about the same time, and I'm still yet to wrap my head around the two tragical stories. No, three. One of Waila Omozoa, the newly admitted undergraduate who was said to have gone to a church to read and then was raped. I have seen the photos of the bloodstained floor of the church and the scattered books on the floor. She was smashed in the head with a fire extinguisher. How gory! I still can't comprehend how such a crime could take place in a church. It is outrageous. It's totally condemnable. Last year, I shouted myself hoarse, talking and explaining how rape is not about cleavages. It's not about improper dressing or exposure of body parts. Otherwise, what's the justification for the rape of minors who are aged three, six, eight years old? Remember the case of a six months girl, the one that the um, wife of the president in, you know, intervened in. Rape is unjustifiable. Unfortunately, again, it has been linked to a worship center. The last time it made national news and social media opera, it was linked to a pastor. What was the outcome? We can't continue to treat this monster with kids', kids gloves. And now the second, a preteen is gang raped by 11 men in Jigawa. This is exhausting. Even more unfathomable is the little girl, Tina, who was shot by trigger-happy policemen. How can we ever identify and punish her killers who were men in uniform? How can a human being train a gun at a hapless young girl selling whatnots by the roadside? The police should protect us, but they're snuffing life out of us. Tina did not pose a threat to anyone. Why waste her? And what policeman had zero compassion at the time of the COVID pandemic to just kill just because he could? No, it's not right. Tina was not a criminal. And this time, 
we Nigerian women demand justice. We ask our president to address both the rape of war issue. Or when will the presidency deem it fit to ever respond to issues like this? When will the governor of Edo State deem it fit to respond to this issue and address the people of Edo State? I am still searching for a statement from the Ministry of Women Affairs. This should not be swallowed up, by the way, in the bureaucracy or politics of who is in charge of what and what. The Inspector General of Police, these cases need resolution. And then they will serve as deterrents. We need cases of deterrence. What is needful and what we want, I sum up in three words, investigate. We have plain clothes detectives and forensic experts. Prosecute, actually arraign suspects. Let not mobility fee kill this one. The third one, enforce, enforce the law, enforce, enforce. We want justice. We all say no to rip. Absolutely. Thank I, you. Can I add the, yeah. what I think is also, um, in terms of the three words you talked about, um, you know, investigate, um, prosecute, and enforce. And I think there's a lot of responsibility that also lies with, with families, parents, especially fathers and mothers, about teaching young boys yeah. and responsibility, you know, because we talked about this earlier, where there's this emphasis on, oh, let's make sure the, our young women are protected. Are, are protected. But we, we often, as a society, do not pay the same level of attention to, to, the, the, boys. to the boys. And they grow up thinking that they have the sense of entitlement that women are theirs, that you can take them, you can do whatever. Because um, that sense of power and false sense of power that sits yes. in our heads, I think is something that we need a lot of education. Not just parents, but also um, schools. Um, that we need to transfer a lot of attention to it, a lot of enlightenment needs to go on. But I absolutely, I think it's abhorrent, and I think that we need to set examples of not just the, the young boys, but also of the powerful. Because the moment the powerful, like the pastor that was allegedly uh, raped, uh, you know, uh, the wife of a celebrity, if we had managed to bring wow. such a person to book, such a powerful person, it sends a message down the line. Right. But when the powerful can get away with it, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it sends also a wrong message down the system that, you know, I mean, I can do it. Um, I, I only get prosecuted if I'm not strong, but if I'm well connected, then I can get away with it. And I think that's a message we need to find yeah, a way to uh, do to, it. To I'm add, going to, to that, add. I'm sorry. America, you yes. have spoken my mind. The truth is, frustration and dehumanization of the situation makes it look permissible. Why do you take a woman's choice? Why do you think you have the right to take the choice for consent? The truth is, rape is a crime. It's a crime everywhere. In all over the world, there's ages and limits for what the consent age is. And even at that consent age, you can decline at the very last minute. I don't know how it becomes okay to rape anyone at any time. It's never the fault of the victim. It's always the fault of the aggressor. And then quickly, this quickly, is where the, uh, is, um, the quickly, uh, reform criminal quickly, justice tells us. Quickly, um, it tells us I, I and we also, need to challenge it. I, I also up. would want to add that, um, you know, the society needs to do a lot. Yeah, why you train the boys to also, because if you want to raise queens, mm -hmm. you also need to learn to train kings. And um, why the society also need to do a lot, the situation where somebody is raped, you get to the police station yeah. and it begins to ask you, what were you wearing? Exactly. At what point of the day? Where did it take place? How can you be in a man's house? You know, it, it, it gives the impression that the man can do anyhow yes. with the woman. And then secondly, the victimization, you know. Um, the stigma. The stigma. Yes. And then you get to court, the windmill of justice, we say, grind slowly but surely. But we forget that justice delayed is justice, justice denied. denied. And, and so, you know, how does the society respond to this issue? It's not enough. Why it is good, you know, to campaign about it, talk about it, but also the society needs to be sensitized that this is a crime and that once a crime Always is committed, crime. irrespective of your status, like we all have agreed, that that person okay. should face the music. Our movie producers and our musicians, Please use your powerful media because, you know, these are mediums. Use it to sensitize the people. What I've seen on social media is that we have 
almost a rape culture. We have enablers, a lot yeah. of enablers. Well, as we speak out for others, we look to you to speak for us as concerns the effectiveness of our advocacy. On the Infectious Disease Control Bill, Motion Without Movement, Simeon B. has this to say. As much as I'm a fan of liberals, I beg to differ on calling Lee Kuan Yew a dictator. The citizens of Singapore lent LKY their credence and voted for his party repeatedly because they saw his vision and he delivered a result for Singapore. Sorry to digress from the issue. Well, no need to apologize, Simeon. All angles are welcome. On envisioning a new Nigeria and new Africa, Black Sun Horizons 44 Black Horus says, I hate to reference the Chinese, but they have a saying that, that is universal for individuals as well as collectives. The African Global Collective, crisis is equal to opportunity. When we face a crisis, we have two choices. We can act and think with low energy and get depressed and act accordingly which will lead to a slow induced transition to an even worse situation. Or we can ask, what is the silver lining in this situation? What is the positive in this imbroglio? If we ask the right questions, we always get a response. Immense undreamed of opportunities lie waiting for the bold, the pioneering, the resolute, the iron willed. They're there for certain, just waiting to be unveiled. And this viewer goes on to say, absolutely brilliant, amazing, forward-thinking panel. The energy is infectious. One can sense and feel it oozing right off the screen. Well, thank you for the encouraging feedback. Keep it locked, as they say. And do keep your comments coming in on Facebook, plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate in G, or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate in G. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com slash the advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Now, after the break, Seydou speaks of the reawakening of the giant. It's a direct cry from the heart. I'll let him speak for himself. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Just as there are seasons, there's a time for sleep and there's a time for action. We are awakening the giant. The last few days has witnessed a remarkable event that may reshape the perception of the black race. The mother of George Ford by a Minneapolis policeman, the races ran by Amy Cooper, and the not so subtle plot to tarnish and ultimately remove Mr. Kumi additional as the CEO of African Development Bank has raised some pertinent questions about our identity as a people. For many years, black people, or people of color, as I like to put it, have been subjected to various forms of physical, psychological, and mental abuse. Our history and, our, and identity have been distorted, and we are now made to believe that we're the back to the rest of the world. This position would have made sense if nearly all the world's mineral and precious deposits we're not situated in Africa. The price of our raw material is depreciating daily, yet the price of finished or semi-processed products are sorry. According to Mr. Adeshino, Africa accounts for over 70% of global cocoa production and 2% of the 100 billion chocolate market. Africa must wake up. The dream of our great leaders, like Kwame Nkrumah, for a united and borderless Africa is now. 
We must never export raw materials again without adding value to it. Africa spends $35 billion on food imports today, and that figure will grow to over $100 billion by 2025 if nothing is done to address this environment. We must shed our loss for foreign grants and other external ex uh, interventions, as they have not served us in any way. Our development may not serve the purpose of our supposed colonial masters. This is a call to action for every African, and by extension, every person of color, to contribute towards the success of Africa. If we succeed, they succeed. I would end with an African phrase, Ubuntu, I am because we are fantastic let me just jump in right here this is a topic topical to my heart as you guys know i'm in canada so racism is something that i must have experienced just believe it that anybody in the diaspora who is in any reasonable function has experienced racism now you know what they say the final straw that broke the camel's back i think was george floyd you know, if you're stacking the, the caramel, you won't know that this is the last straw. Now the back of the caramel has been broken and you can't put it back. And now all over the world is riots everywhere. Even in as white and peaceful as Amsterdam, you see lot, hundreds of people, thousands of people coming out to say, you know what, this is not right. For the first time, white police officers are coming on TikTok, YouTube to say, you know what, this man was murdered. How can you say I cannot breathe, and yet you can't just release him? Meanwhile, you have four people with guns, and this man is handcuffed. How powerful is he? So we know that this is a genocide. So what I'm saying is, everything needs to start from the critical justice system reform. Now, you cannot change the mind of a human being. A hu an evil human being is an evil human being, and they're evil geniuses. I can't know what's in your mind, but whenever you break the law, Whenever you kill someone, you should be held to book. So for me, I'm very excited about the new tomorrow for the black race. Okay, black lives actually do matter. You understand? You tell me it doesn't matter. I will tell you it's an equal life. If we do the DNA analysis, China, England, United States, Nigeria, Ghana, we're all the same DNA sequence. So we're all human. Um. Yeah, I want to look at it from um, the African perspective. Um, the world looks down on Africa because our leaders look down on us. As we are in Africa, we, are, we can't breathe also. In Nigeria, we can't breathe. We it's, can't. It's worse we can't for us. breathe. Just now we talked about health. We can't breathe. No, we can't. We're talking about funds meant to develop the Niger Delta, finding its way into private pocket. The Niger Delta can't breathe. And, and so when you have a situation like that where our leaders you know, have their, their, their kneel on our neck and our hands in handcuff and we can't breathe. Why wouldn't the rest of the world look down on us? Absolutely. And that's why they are looking down on us. If, as um, um, Akiwumia uh, had said, and like um, as re echoed by uh, Seidu, if we don't only export cocoa, but we add value to cocoa. Right. And then that $100 billion industry, we have 60 percent of it. Nobody will come detect to us. If we do not export crude, we refine it here and we add value to it. Nobody will detect to us. If we do not bring in Chinese to come process our raw materials and then in some cases take it back home and bring it to us, nobody will detect to us. Our leaders and the rest of us as followers have allowed all of this. We can't break. Rather than sh cry out that we can't breathe, we remain there. And that's why the world is seeing us as, as um, the backwaters. Until we rise up, like we said last week, and see this as an opportunity to spring forth and raise a new Africa. Ten years from now, we'll still be complaining that we can't breathe. Well, let me quickly jump in. What I want to say is yeah. the BBC report about um, Akimumi. The fact that they referred to his suits and his bow ties and that he's flamboyant, I found it distasteful. It's, this um, is a man who would had a career before he even became a minister in Nigeria and then went on to become, it, you know, the president of the AFDB. It's, how, all, how in, you, it's all in the name of calling, giving a dog a bad name. No, give a dog a bad name. Give a dog a bad name in it's, order it's, to hang it's, it. It's amazing. But uh, let, 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 me, let me say that um, 
again, I'm going to quote one of my favorite writers, Lance Morrow. And he said something that was significant. He said something that there's something about um, the African development clock or the African psyche that broke when, when colonial governments, when colonialism came into us. And, just, and we're still, that clock, we're still trying to fix it. And, and some of the vestiges of the brokenness of that clock, uh, that development cycle, is the kind of leaders. So, yeah. um, so they enable the worst of us to, to be, rule the, to best, rule of the us. best of us. And that's a system. Um, and again, in terms of the racism, um, that's part of it. Because to control a people that needed to knock us down and make us look like beasts, less than human, so, so that someone will actually feel justified. You know, I mean, if you go to the, 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 the horrible carnage in Rwanda and so describe people as cockroaches, you know, yeah. the, so if I make you less than a human yeah. being, yeah. then I'll feel no guilt, no nothing, if when yes. I cross you or when I, when, I, when I unleash evil on you. And that's been a, it's been a systematic process that is still with us, and we, we, we have to battle it. And I think that, um, Liberos, your point is exactly germane, that we need, as a people, as a cycle within us as Africans, to do more. In fact, to trade, for example, we need to trade more with, 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 with ourselves. With ourselves. Yeah. You know, know. That's the first yes. thing. Because if you're not doing that, if you're not building our own economy, building our own confidence, um, then we keep looking up to the West yes. or to, for, to, yes. for grants. For, for grants. For this yes. over-reliance, if the West is not in it, then it's not validated, yeah. it should stop. Yeah. I mean, look at AFDB. The U.S. is the biggest shareholder there. No, they're not. No, they're actually no. only 6%. Yeah, only 6%. 6%. 6%. 6%. But, but they, they are, have this power. No, because and you, you, use, you trade with their dollar. You trade with, yeah. you trade with their dollar. Any dollar that they can actually, you're sitting in a village in somewhere in Enugu State, and because you use a dollar transaction, they can come and arrest you because you traded with it. So they've created the world economic system. And, they, yeah. and, and, and then you rely on it. And so when you rely on such, such trade, it makes them look as if, oh, yes, yeah. they can always detect and, and, and so that's basically what's right. happening here. Right. So, um, a resounding cry, if I ever had one, I'm still in the midst of questioning the status quo. Allow me to table some questions of my own um, after the break. But before we go, uh, you know, just to keep reemphasizing this, we need to end the rape culture um, that's prevalent in our country. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What well, I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. For me, my advocacy this week is really, let's start from the absence of dissent. It's often taken as acquiescence. So my big question today is, is science the new religion? Long before the evil of the pandemic hit the world, we've been assailed by narratives about the importance of science and the seeming disregard or relegation of, this very, of the importance of science by some world leaders, especially the recent ones in 2015. They seem to have come caught from the same mold. Arguments have been marshaled in support of the necessity for world leaders to trust more in science and technology. And we've become witnesses to the value of science and technology in driving development across the globe. There's no, there's no lie about that. There's abundant evidence that humanity has made vital progress because of science. And surely the world would have been a much crueler, darker place without the benefits or the reliance on scientific discoveries, which has boosted things like agriculture, transport, industry, defense, and more importantly, our health and medical sciences. The fact that we can tie the growth of nations to how advanced they are in science and technology is a good example, reflection of that. However, I would like to touch on the worrying narrative, which I guess COVID-19 has helped to uncover, or rather damage this illusion about science, which is that science and technology is a solution of all problems. And we have begun to see Indeed, we have elevated science to the status of a religion with its own high priests and miracle-working pastors. WHO, for example, 
must know it all simply because they are the World Health Organization. Elon Musk, the spaceman, the mass man, the savior of mankind, is going to take all of us to Mars. Everything NASA says must be an unquestionable fact. Well, we know this is simply not true. I'm not pursuing some type of relativism here. I'm just saying that history has proven to us that just as religion can be wrong and even cause more damage, science can equally be wrong too, can be misinterpreted, can be weaponized, can be bought and influenced by state and non-state actors. And indeed, science is not a repl replacement for humanity, for our humanity, or indeed for, for God, for those who believe in God. That being said, the beauty of good science is that it allows itself to be questioned, criticized, and peer-reviewed. Any good scientist knows that his work, no matter how great or groundbreaking or consequential, can always be questioned and improved upon. Because we are humans and because we evolve, and our knowledge about what we know and most importantly, what we don't even know grows. With COVID-19, we've been witnesses to the roller coaster of different reports about the virus, how it spreads, what can be used to treat it and avoid it. Despite all of this glorious attention humanity has paid to technology, almost six months later, we do not yet have a clear, clear solution as to why or how this, this awful disease is ravages people's countries and so on. We are discovering every new time that the simple things of nature we often ignored in the past are now even more important in protecting us and helping us to get through this period. Herbs, roots, vegetables, laughter, the sun, the love of family and friends, and ensuring that we all become stronger together. So beyond science and religion, I think the most important thing is the recognition that our humanity trumps everything, that science or technology or indeed religion can sow division or seek to plunder and be weaponized will not save us. Our humanity will save humanity. You know, like um, our the Germans humanity said, will save humanity. Um, humanity, yeah. God and humanity for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 uh, and then I, I like the fact, you know, that you remind people that humanity will save humanity. And this brings me back to Africa again, you know. Um, in this um, COVID-19, a lot of people had thought that um, Africa would, um, when it gets to Africa, Africans would be dropping dead like... Um, oh, they were anticipating you know, that. And then, and then now, not that's not happening and it won't happen. It won't. Yeah, not because we are so godly yeah. or no. so religious, but because of those little things that you pointed out, humanity. Roots, herbs. And then those... <laughs> you know, natural things that we take for granted. And you find out that, that, you know, we share love, family, who together, and in spite of the fact of social distancing, you still see people Laughter, come together, you know, you know share mm, jokes. Yeah. And then, um, you know, so all of this for me, I think is what's saving us more. If you like, you also said, um, the World Health Organization would come with different, you know, diagnosis. At some point, it was that, oh no, you're not this, you don't even don't need the ventilator to treat, you know, COVID-19 patients. You know, so all of that, but in all of this, most of the patients in Africa, in Nigeria, I've never heard of one being used, in, I've never heard of a ventilator being used to treat patients here. Yeah. <laughs> but yet we're treating people. Yeah. And, and so that's why for us, if we have a little bit of humanity in everything that we do, are we not steal money that is meant to develop? you know, the society. I will not steal money that is meant to build schools. I will not make promises I can't keep. I will also not go into government because I want to enhance my personal pocket. I will not rip, you know, another that. person. Mean. So that's why in all of this, whatever we say, science is good, it's fantastic, it has its own shortcoming, but humanity will save humanity to round up with what Humanity you trumps everything. I'll never uh, forget that phrase. And if you have respect for humanity, you wouldn't go shooting at a heartless yeah. Yeah. teenager, pre-teenager. You yeah. wouldn't go raping and justifying rape of another human being. What I thought COVID-19 would have done for us was to have restored our humanity, our lost humanity, because we're all running the rat race. Mm. But look at where we are. I hope and pray that indeed humanity will save humanity moving forward post-COVID. Yeah, um, Seydou, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I want to add something. Yeah. Um, Emeka's... Uh, Advocacy today is very interesting. I'm a scientist, so I can relate with engineer. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Shoot, shoot. 
So I can, I can relate with his submission. However, science, what there's, there's a little confusion here. Science does not, it's not an answer. It, 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 it has not the creed that has answer to everything. What science does basically is to uh, give you that inquisitive mind to question things. Right. Today we've been battling with cancer. We've not found uh, the solution to cancer, HIV. But does it mean research is not ongoing? It's still ongoing. What science does basically is just for you to question things. Once upon a time, the world thought eventually that that uh, position was disproved until somebody proved that Earth was 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 spherical. So science is continuous knowledge. There's a body of knowledge that you continue to add to. Now, relating it to uh, COVID, COVID is a new situation for science. It took everybody by storm. Now, you may want to ask that those uh, herbalists and the little people that we look down on, to me, they're scientists as well. People that question things, that want to prefer solutions. They're in their way, but what we're saying is they have to be regulated. Right. So, yes. And my religion tells me to be inquisitive. So there is like a fine, there's a fine divide between religion and science. Mm -hmm. My religion so is so humanity. Seek knowledge. Knowledge is science. knowledge is power. Excuse me. Tied to so humanity. So that let, let's go to Ruke. Let's go to Ruke. Okay, okay, so let me power. tell you what I think. Knowledge. The science. For sure. So then, and my first question speaks to is science your new religion? And the answer is absolutely not. Science can never be a religion because science is just different people collecting facts together and making theories and then proving the theories. The lucky thing about this coronavirus, um, COVID-19, it started in Wuhan, China, and it spread all over the world. And to be honest, I think there's something a bit mysterious, probably suspicious about this, because first of all, China didn't tell us how this virus really started. And then they never really told us how to treat the virus. We've had to figure it out ourselves after hundreds and thousands of people have died. But like you said, science, science is science. It's not for one person. It's the same science all over the world. The same science of what Einstein started is the same science of today. Science is perfect. There's no error in science. So all of us there can is, be scientists. There, and there are, there are. Going back to this. If there are we no error, there won't be improvement on it. This lockdown, there. all these things, we have to find answers to this coronavirus and we know there are answers to every single virus and it will come to end it will come to pass that this virus even this deadly virus will have its own lifespan so yeah, um, what i want to end is that there is hope people don't is not absolute. Will end up having real hugs not Seiju. virtual hugs Seiju, yeah. you were saying something yes i said science is not absolute it's not it perfect it's not absolute it's okay. evolved okay. we keep getting better but we what Emeka is basically <laughs> saying is, uh, I, I, Emeka is here, I don't want to speak to him, but what I understand from Emeka's advocacy yeah. is a question, is science the new God? He talked about the role science plays, but in all of that, humanity is the new Trumps. God. Fantastic. Okay, so we need to go. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much. I, you know, because this is, it's a question I'm asking, and I, hopefully when, we, when, 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 when viewers, when you guys watch this, you might have your own perspective. So I'm not going to weigh in more, more than I've already said. I've said it in my... In my, in my advocacy. So I have no doubt that we have ignited some fires um, on this edition. Um, as I said, feel free to continue the conversation on our social media platforms, on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, um, hashtag the advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, um, hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up on previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate. Um, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please, please, uh, Plus TV Africa. Till next time, we'll be dropping challenging and stirring issues for your engagement and consideration. Let's keep advocating for a better society. Thank you. And from all of us, um, say no. Say no to rape. Say no to rape. Say no to Thank rape. you, guys. The be violence good. of black lives actually do matter. Absolutely. And black <laughs> lives matter. Signs. <laughs> I believe in signs. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country 
when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.